What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Sarah Wild. I'm a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Um, I've been out of school for just a little over a year now. So I am practicing in a small town, Indiana. I love my job. I work at a community hospital. Um, not a huge hospital, but I feel like we do a wide variety of things and it really has grown my practice in the first year of practicing autonomously. And I love it because um, there is no supervision. There is no MDs dictating what we do. We're all very independent. We all determine our own anesthetic for each patient. Um, and I get to do lots of regional, lots of OB, epidural, spinals, generals, everything. So it's been really good. So anyways, I love my job. And I know um, if you're here on this channel, you're probably in some way um, interested in anesthesia or you're in anesthesia welcome i'm so glad you're here and i will be talking all things clinical rotations as a new crna student i don't know if you're in anesthesia school yet or you will be soon Save this video for when you are getting ready to go into clinicals. Hopefully it'll be helpful because that's, it's a big deal when you start your clinicals. So before I tell you guys my tips and tricks, or maybe just some advice for your first couple months of clinicals, a real quick funny story. My first week um, in clinical rotations, nervous, overwhelmed, um, my first rotation was a big level one trauma center. They were throwing us into some pretty big extreme cases. <sighs> I'll never forget. And I was like, I'm a go-getter. Like I will never say, Oh, maybe I should start with this. Like I wanted to see the biggest of the worst of the extreme. I had no idea what I was doing, but I didn't care. I acted like, yeah, yeah. I want to do, I want to do that case. I want to do the transplants. I want to do the gunshot wounds. I want to do the, I mean, I literally did a few a pheochromocytoma my first week in clinical rotations, which you need to do that like your second year. <laughs> but I never forget my first week, maybe, I think it was like my second or third day. It wasn't my first day, second or third day. They were doing a big, I don't remember what case it was, but it was a big enough case where they needed a central line. Um, one of the MDs was actually doing the central line and I was like, hey, can I glove up and do the central line with you? Now, let me tell you, I, I had maybe just intubated for the first time the day before. Like, I didn't, it didn't matter to me. I wanted to do the central line. I was like, yeah. I was like, hey, can I do the central line with you? And he's like, sure, go, you know, go get you some gloves. <laughs> so I, I was taking, I couldn't find the gloves and I, I, I hated asking for help, which is not a good, it's not a good thing, but I was like trying to find the gloves. So I was, so he was gloved up, gowned and gloved up already like getting his stuff organized. I'll never forget. I came running back in the room. <laughs> Forgot to even put a mask on. Okay. So the patient is draped now, sterile field. He's got his kid open to do the central line. He's gowned and draped. I come running in the room. Forgot to put a mask on. I trip over my shoelace. <laughs> I trip and fall, almost hitting the sterile field. I like fall at his feet. <laughs> I'll never forget. Everyone was like, <gasps> look, like here's a student, forgets to put a mask on, fell, tripped over her untied shoelaces. And I remember he like catches me. So I messed up his sterile field. He like catches me and he looks at me and he's like, he kind of like laughs and he's like, take a deep breath and take a deep breath. He goes, go put a mask on and tomorrow come back with shoes that don't have laces. <laughs> I was just like mortified. I was just like, I felt like Bambi, like Bam and I've always been a very confident person. I've always been good at what I do. And I like literally just not only tripped, I forgot a mask, broke sterile feel. Like I just did it all. It was brutal, but thankful in that situation, he was very, I think I was just so pitiful. He was gracious to me. 
So don't be me on the first day. Make sure your shoes are tied. Wear your dumb mask. I think we all have good practice with COVID. Wear your mask. Don't break sterile field. You got this. <laughs> Anyways, okay, now for our tips. If you are in anesthesia school, you're probably in one of two programs, either what's called an integrated program where you start clinicals pretty soon into your program or you're front loaded, meaning you study, um, do a lot of in classroom for almost up to a year, two to three semesters, and then you start clinicals. Either program you're in, whichever way you go, this video will be helpful for you. Um, we all know anesthesia school can be very stressful. It takes a lot to even get to anesthesia school, to get into the program. Um, obviously being a nurse is an incredible career. It takes a lot to get there. And then just to get into anesthesia school alone is another huge feat. And congratulations for any of you that have gotten into school or maybe you are in nursing program or getting into nursing and that's what you want to do. It's an incredible career, but the journey can be long and tenuous. So I uh, just want to give you guys some tips and tricks and just kind of give you some insight on what it's like to be a new, um, to be an anesthesia student going into the hospital for the first time. We all have different experiences. Um, Everyone's school's different. The, a lot of the students that I get to work with now, they seem to all have really loved their clinical experiences so far. Maybe they just tell me that. But I, my clinical experience was hard. Our, I felt like our students or my classmates, we were, we all definitely went through some pretty survival of the fittest. There were certain people like, there was literally one person, I won't name them, but like at this one hospital, there was one person that if like we, if we knew they were in the vicinity, we would go hide in the closet <laughs> because we knew they were just known for being a bully, like just straight bully. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if these kind of people went through that kind of hazing, but it happens and more than likely you're going to experience something like that. And it's stressful and it's hard, but survive. Survive, get through it. Um, don't let anything rattle your cage. Like just say, gonna take it as it comes. It, it'll be part of who you are as a practitioner. And when things get really hard, you're gonna respond really well because you were personally treated poorly and you were able to maintain. You're able Anyways, um, having said that, you can do this, you will survive. Um, just take it one day at a time, seriously. One foot in front of the other. Have that grit determination like nothing's gonna stop you. You are gonna work hard, you're gonna learn, and you're going to succeed because at the end of the day, sometimes you have to have just that, that determination, especially in your first couple months of clinical rotations. They're hard, it's overwhelming. I remember thinking every day driving to my clinical rotation, I would like, oh my gosh, there is so much I don't know, like so much I don't know. Like, like I would have these brain farts, like I, I've tried to memorize all these drugs and I've tried to remember, memorize the mechanism of action. I've tried to remember the adverse side effects and I've tried to remember onset and try to like the interactions with our medications, what I can't like, and I would just like, whoa, like what am I, like how am I supposed to go and be grilled by these CRNAs and doctors and know everything? And it, it was it was scary at times, but I went, I showed up, I worked hard, I tried to do what was expected of me, and I kept doing it every day over and over and over. So you got this. I hope these can help you and just kind of give some insight, knowing what clinicals will be like and what to expect. I know right now you're probably super overwhelmed with school and studying and trying to manage your home life and your family life. Um, probably by now you've already given up on your friend's life because let's face it, when you're in anesthesia school, there's just, you can't do everything. And I loved my friends, but I remember telling my friends, I'll see you guys in a couple years. So. Um, going to clinicals can be a very overwhelming time in school because it's like you're so green, you're so fresh. So these, I just want to kind of go over a couple basic things that maybe will help you do well 
and avoid maybe some of the situations that I went through or my classmates went through because we, it was just kind of like thrown in. We didn't have much of a reference of what we we're getting into. So I hope I can be a help. Um, DM me with any questions, comment below. Maybe if you had a different experience than me and how it was different. I love to hear everybody's experiences and stuff. So yeah, so here we go. Tip number one, be early. So everywhere is going to be different, but for the most part, your CRNA is going to get there anywhere from 45 minutes early to 15 minutes early. I remember one clinical site I went to, they were there like right before the case, but that's because they had someone doing all the pre-op and everything. For the most part, it's pretty normal, I would say, for your CRNAs to get there at least 45 minutes to an hour early to pre-op their patient, create an anesthetic plan, do all that stuff, set up the room. So get there early. Um, ask around based on your clinical sites about what time the CRNAs get there and go from there. You want to be able to get there before your CRNA, figure out what room you're in, um, you want to look up the patient and get a general health history on them. And I get it when you're new, you're going to be kind of green as what to look up and stuff. Just, just write it, get your paper and write down their health history, what meds they're on, what surgeries they've had. And then go to your room and just try to set up the room. I know by the end of your program, you're going to set up your room completely different than you did when you started. But just the fact that you get there, you try to set up, you pull up syringes, don't pull up meds yet because every CRNA is different based on if they want you to have what meds, but get syringes ready. Like just literally think ahead and do as much as you can just to show the person you're with, you're assertive, you're hardworking, you're trying to critically think, like you're trying to be as helpful as possible. It's never going to be the same. Your CRNA is going to come in and they're going to switch things around. They're going to put the trash can here and they're going to, cause like a lot of people in this profession are so freaking type A, it's ridiculous. So just expect everything to be changed. But just the fact that you were there, you attempted, we'll give you brownie points. Okay. Um, so get there early, be prepared as much as you can. Okay. So that's tip one. I guess what kind of goes into tip one as far as being prepared is knowing your drugs. So we do anesthesia. Pharmacology is what we do. We study pharmacology related to anesthesia, related to surgery, related to regional pain management. So know your top drawer. And I, I'm telling you, I say that I realized it took me a while to really know my top drawer. I think even by my senior year, there were like things I was just forgetting, but get Quizlet. Quizlet every morning, every morning before clinicals, I had my induction drugs. I would read through their onset, duration, mechanism of action, and I would know like general adverse effects, but there's always those like weird adverse effects that you should remember. Let me tell you, know why you shouldn't give Decadron while the patient's awake. I mean, that was like funny things like that. There's always like certain drugs that like your CRNA will ask you, be like, do you think we should give Decadron before we put the patient to sleep? You know, why do you think that? There's going to be so many times where you're going to be like, I don't know. I know I should know this, but I don't. Let me tell you, instead of saying, I don't know. A great response would be like, oh, man, I, let me go look that up and I'll get back to you. Or, um, I'm sorry, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I'm going to go look that up and I'm going to study that. You know, because while they understand you're not going to know everything, you still are studying and you should be fresh on some of this stuff. So study your induction drugs, study your top drawer drugs, study your emergency drugs. And that's why I loved Quizlet. I could literally flip through it all the time. I go to the bathroom, I pull out my phone, flip, 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 flip. I'm having breakfast, I'm getting a snack, whatever I'm doing, I'm flipping through Quizlet, just literally pounding those, that information of stuff that I'm gonna use over and over and over and over. And probably talk to some of your upperclassmen. A lot of them have already done like Quizlet, books for induction drugs, uh, books for, paralytics, books for emergency drugs, 
See if you can get those from them just to help you refresh and study over and over and over. All right, so that's tip number one. Tip number two. So I know I already talked about under tip one, being prepared and how to do that. Tip number two, I wanna talk about in a sense of how to actually be prepared for your cases. Now, I'm gonna to introduce to you guys a tool. You might already use it. My program actually introduced it to me. I, this is so helpful, so, so, so helpful for me, especially in school. I still reference it every now and then in my practice now. It's an app called Vargo, V-A-R-G-O, and I'm gonna link it here. Um, it is such an invaluable tool. So initially, I got a textbook. I'm like, I'm gonna bring this textbook with me to clinicals if I need to look up a case, get specific information. Having a resource that you can just whip out on your phone, look up a specific case. So I, there's many, many features that are wonderful on this app. Um, my favorite feature was you can look up specific cases, go on search case, type in the type of case you're doing, and it brings up all the information you need to know. Um, and, and it's written from a clinical perspective. So actually, the gentleman who wrote this app, he practices anesthesia. But I love it so much because I'll get ready for a case. I'll look up like, okay, what do most people use as far as, can we do a deep MAC, a deep MAC with this? Or does this really need to be general? And it'll talk things through. I remember when I started doing like shunts. Like there are specific times in the case where it's super stimulating and you need to know, have your propofol stick ready to push. A ser I felt like a lot of my serenades never told me that. Like they wanted to see if I knew what to do. So um, that app Vargo was super, super helpful clinically knowing um, it, it talks about like robots, IV access, fluid replacement, neuro, it talked about, it'll tell you all the different drugs you need to think about, specific side effects. It just gives you so many invaluable tips and tricks for each specific case. Um, I remember my first clinical site, it's maybe my second week, they put me on a pheochromocytoma where it's like, the setup is pretty extreme. You have to have many different types of pressors, uppers and downers, like ready to go because it can be catastrophic if you're not prepared or if the surgeon nicks something. And like, I, I would never have known any of this if it weren't for like the specific case of this app that helped me go through everything. Like you just can't remember every type of case and every kind of setup. So super helpful. They also have a really good OB section. And I'm gonna be doing, I wanna do just a YouTube video for you guys specifically on Vargo, just everything that it's capable of, all like just navigating through the app. Um, so I don't wanna get in that today, but this is, it's a great tool and I encourage you guys to look over. I know um, it's $99 just to get the app and then you have access to it forever, which it, it, it is a tool, like it's cheaper than a textbook and you will use it way more than your textbook. I don't use textbooks anymore. I use this all the time. And it's all information he gets from textbooks. It's all um, standard practice. It's all evidence-based practice of what's going on today. I do know sometimes they do um, like class discounts. So if you can get enough of your classmates to wanna get the app, that he'll do some sort of discount. Um, yeah, so check into that incredible source. So being prepared for each individual case and just Pushing yourself, is this a general LMA or is it a MAC? Don't go looking so dumb. Like, you know, when I have students now, I'll say, great, have you seen the patient? What do you think we should do? And I, I don't care if they are wrong. I don't care if, I just want them to have an opinion. I want them to have thought about it, to have tried to think about it. So don't just say, well, I'm new, I don't know. That's not acceptable come up with an opinion. And I'm telling you, this source is a great way for you to have an opinion and just have some sort of reference. Like you don't have to memorize every type of surgery and what kind of anesthesia to do, you have a resource. But don't go into clinicals and saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Try to know, try to educate yourself, try to have an opinion for based off of a resource. And this is a great resource. So be prepared for each type of case you're going to do. Okay, next, be a learner. Um, 
I remember like, so we're all our, at that point, we all have our bachelor's degree, maybe more in nursing. We are educated. We have been practicing nursing for years. We have seen some pretty incredible stuff, dealt with some pretty incredible stuff. We are medical professionals, okay? It's hard to take that step down into not only being a student, but being a student treated pretty poorly, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I, I could tell you story after story of just being degraded by CRNAs, MDs in my clinical sites. It was, it's pretty sad, honestly, but at the end of the day, it taught me no matter what, no matter how anybody treated me, I'm in control of how I respond. I will never forget to this day, I had a pretty poor situation. Um, and I remember the head of my school actually called me up and she said, hey, Sarah, you cannot control other people. You, you can't control how they treat you. People are gonna treat you poorly. She goes, and she goes, I highly encourage you to do something. And this will follow you the rest of your career, the rest of your practice, the rest of your life. And she said, in hard, in any situation, you need to learn to respond and not react. And I, I thought about that because like, I was being treated very poorly and it, it was, um, and the school had my back. They, they, they agreed that it was a poor situation. And my, I wanted to react. I wanted to say, you can't treat me like this. Don't, you know, like I wanted to have this reaction, but at the end of the day, I had to respond by not saying anything, by not defending myself and just moving on. And it was hard, but is what was needed in that situation. So keep that in the back of your mind, learning to respond and not react and just be a learner. There are going to be times I'm, I kid you not. I can tell you story, so many stories of CRNAs who told me I was wrong and proceeded to tell me why they were right. And it was so wrong, so wrong. I remember this one CRNA was telling me how after you thread the catheter through your Tui needle, it's okay to pull back. Like that is like the cardinal rule of epidurals. You do not pull your catheter back. But like she was lecturing me on how I was wrong for saying that. And I remember just sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, like, wow. But I knew it, like, you, you can't say that. You cannot say that when they are your preceptor, you, you can't say anything. Like, you're gonna have experiences where you're just like mind blown. Like, this is so bad. This is so bad. You just gotta move on. You gotta be a learner. I remember there was one situation where, again, I thought I was right. <laughs> Shocker. All of us nurses, none of us think we're right. And the CRNA kind of told me what I did was wrong and proceeded to tell me all the reasons why. And I remember thinking like, I want to disagree with her so bad, but I can't, I can't. And I remember someone gave me the advice. They said, sometimes if you're in a situation and you know you're right and they're wrong, all you can say is, I, I had no, I'm, I'm trying to think of exactly how to say it. Say, <laughs> Thank you so much. I I have not learned that yet. I am I will definitely go home and study that more. I really appreciate it. You know, it's like thank you. Thank you for teaching me. You know, cuz at the end of the day, like even me, I I'm only been out for a year and I love having students and I know I do things different than my counterparts and they may see something I do and be like, mm, "I disagree with that." But at the end of the day, they still need to realize they're practicing with me and it's my case and it's my anesthesia. They still need to be respectful and go with the flow a little bit with how I'm doing it. So tip number three, be a learner even when it's hard. And um, yeah, be a learner. Talk less, listen more, do. <laughs> so Okay, next tip, be confident. Be confident in who you are. So. I don't mean be confident as go in and do what you want and don't be a learner and don't listen. Be confident, 
go in, have a plan, okay? So many times my students that I've worked with or back when I was a student, when I would get rattled, it was because I wasn't confident. I didn't have a plan. I was just kind of like, oh, like overwhelmed. It's okay. Be confident. Have a plan. If you do things different or you were told to do something different, that's okay. Roll with it. But be confident in what you do. Don't just, I remember a couple weeks ago, I had a student so new, you know, so when I have students, I do not grill them. I do not lecture them or pimp them. I kind of say, what are you comfortable at? You know, I'll kind of walk you through maybe things I do differently, whatever. But I remember we're going to end up going to intubate the patient and I'm telling you she has this blade in her hand and she's shaking and I'm like oh, <laughs> can you do this <laughs> are you okay because you were putting a blade in a patient's mouth like knock on wood I've never broken a patient's tooth like I want to treat that airway super delicate and I want that patient to leave my OR in the same condition they came to me in. And this poor girl is just shaking, so just like visibly nervous and take a breath, it's okay. But like you have to go in with confidence. You have to go in saying, I might not, I might not do it perfect, but man, I'm gonna just go in with confidence. I'm gonna do my best. and. Maybe it's harder for some rather than others. Fake it till you freaking make it, especially at the beginning. Especially at the beginning, like you have the knowledge, the basic knowledge, you gotta put that into practice. So have confidence in what you do. That does not mean you have to know everything, but just be put together, be sure of yourself. Like you know, when a patient comes into the room, you have to put monitors on. I don't know why. I would always forget to do that first. Put the dumb monitors on. It's like I would, like you get so rattled, you don't remember to do the basic stuff. Be confident. So, anyways, okay. The next thing I want to touch on, um, create a routine for yourself. So, people in clinicals for the first month or two, I would say the biggest thing that I see lacking is routine. And I struggle. I remember a senior and I telling me this too, they said, hey, you just need to work on your routine. You need to work on the basics. Like the patient comes in, first thing you do, pulse ox, blood pressure, start the blood pressure, EKGs, pull them over, throw oxygen on while you're getting everything else ready. Like create like a boom, boom, boom. Like a standard, this is what I do for every single patient. And then you can, your other steps can be kind of customized based on your patient. But those first few steps should be the same for every single person. Another thing that often is forgotten is oxygen. Turn your oxygen on. Create an like a algorithm for yourself of the basic things you're going to do every single time. That will help you out so much. That'll make you look confident. That'll give your CRNAs confidence in letting you do things. So create a rhythm, create a specific boom, 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 boom. You're good. All right, next tip. Guys, look, we, we do a lot of stuff anesthesia related, but the airway, the airway, we do every single patient, every single time. I would encourage you before you start your clinical rotations, draw out the airway, draw it out. Um, understand the anatomy of it. I remember I had a patient or I had a student the other day, not the other day, I had a student not too long ago intubating and it's like they would put the blade in and it would be like only halfway in their mouth and they'd be, be trying to intubate. And I'm like thinking, I'm like, do you realize like the tip of your blade is like pushing into the tongue? And I, and I kept saying, you, you gotta put it in a little further you have to get that blade into the vollicula. You have to put the tip of your MAC blade into the vollicula. And she's like, well, I feel like it's in so far. And then she's like, like uh, just really grunting, like I I'm too weak to pull it up. And, and what I realized is she didn't quite have an understanding of the anatomy of the airway. 
So like what I was trying to help her to do wasn't making sense because she just didn't understand the airway. So no big deal. I helped her. We got the patient intubated very safely, no issues. And then later I said, hey, I said, let me show you. I just, I just got literally scrap paper. I'm like, let me just sketch for you the airway. And when that patient's laying back the anatomy of how the tongue flops down, where the epiglottis is, and what happens and how to manipulate the airway in such a way that doesn't hurt the patient, um, doesn't tear up the tongue and the skin, and actually pulls the epiglottis real easy. And it, it doesn't take a lot of manpower. Now this, I'm talking about just a normal airway. There are more difficult airways where it's not that simple. But just understanding basic anatomy goes such a long way. Understanding your retinoids, understanding the vocal cords, understanding where the esophagus is and related to the vocal cords. Guys, I know this might sound dumb, but I remember when I first started, like I never wanted to ask because I felt so dumb, but I'm like, there's the esophagus. And you like, I kind of knew, but like looking in the airway, I was like, I don't know. Did I get it in the vocal cords? Like, there's so, when you first start, there are so many, like, you feel dumb even asking, so you don't ask. Which I'm not saying you have to, but I'm just saying it's good. Anatomy for the airway is just a great thing to really study before you go in. Um, okay, next tip. First, for the first month or two, I would really encourage you, pick one blade and stick with it. I felt like most of my classmates did best with the Mac blade to start because it's most like the anatomical uh, form of the mouth. I love the Miller blade. I did one clinical rotation where I wasn't allowed to use anything but the Miller blade and I got really good at it. And I now use the Miller blade as my emergency blade, but I still like the Mac blade probably more than not. And I still have my certain situations like yeah, anyways, I won't get into that, but um, pick one blade and get really good at it and then switch blades around. Don't like go every other, that's just silly. And do not use the glide scope unless it's indicated for the patient. You're just, you're just hurting yourself. You're not helping yourself. Don't use the glide scope unless it's indicated because you're just, it'll be a crutch. It'll be a crutch to yourself. Um, so yeah, all right, next tip. Have thick skin, have thick skin and realize it's gonna be hard. It is designed to be hard guys because anesthesia is no joke. Giving anesthesia is no joke. There are times where you're like, oh crap. Like you have to respond so fast and confidently and have a good response. So anesthesia school is stressful and it's meant to be but have thick skin, show up every day, ready to work, ready to learn, and get better, grow your skills. Learn from each experience, each case you have, get better. Like think through, okay, that intubation was poor at best. <laughs> Make your next one better. Think through what you can do differently. Just don't go in blind every day, hoping, hoping hoping like you don't get an esophageal intubation. Go in with confidence, know what you did wrong your previous case and get better, get better your next one. I always like, I like am mortified thinking back on some of my clinical experiences for my first rotation, like, wow. Can you imagine like ever hiring me? Seeing what, like, that was stressful. <laughs> it's gonna be hard, you're not gonna be like, the bomb sauce when you first start. You just won't. I don't care who you are, you're gonna be terrible your first few weeks and that's okay. If you can take some of these tips that I've told you to do, you will be far ahead of others. Um, so yeah, good luck guys. I know it can be kind of overwhelming, but you can do it, you can do it. Um, show up every day, show up every day, work hard, be humble, be a learner. You got this. I hope these tips were helpful. I hope um, you're doing well in your journey to anesthesia school. 
if you guys have any questions, please comment below um, or get over to Instagram, DM me. I love just chatting with a lot of you guys about school and about your process there or your just journey there. It's been super fun. Um, on my Instagram, I do a lot of just lifestyle stuff with my family, with my kids, with traveling. Um, but I also do some anesthesia related stuff. So head over to Instagram, check me out there, follow me. Um, Demi, I love, I just love hanging out with you guys and answering all your questions. Well, I've done a couple day in the life videos, which is super fun. Just seeing kind of what it actually looks like to be in the OR and what a work day looks like. Check them out. If you have any questions, comment below. I also have a few different videos just on different topics. Um, I have one video on just tips as you're starting to look for a job. Just some tips that help me um, trying to figure out exactly wanted, what I wanted to do. I've got another video that's just literally um, a bunch of questions from some nursing students that I just did a QA. and a It's kind of lengthy, but in the description I have listed like different questions if you want to go specifically to those places. And just some other stuff. Check it out. Um, thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope it was helpful. Um, subscribe to my channel if you want more anesthesia content. Every once in a while, I throw in some random lifestyle stuff. Um, but yeah, like this video, comment below with any questions. Let me know where you're at in the program. If you're in the program or nursing or looking to get into nursing, shout out to all of my fellow anesthesia peeps out there, my old classmates. Hope you guys are doing well and Cheers to just being in an awesome profession. Anesthesia freaking rocks. I love my job. I would never want to do anything else. So. At the end of the day, you're working to give yourself the quality of life that you desire. Whatever that is, um, it'll be so worth it. Um, yeah, so I just love where I have been able to get with my with my lifestyle. Um, family is super important to me. Um, just being able to spend time with my husband and my kids, traveling. Having a good quality of life is super important to me. And essentially going through school has gotten me there. So I encourage you guys, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You might not see it right now, but there is. You can do it. Work hard. Don't give up. You got this. Um, I know you guys have gotten through either working on nursing school or you've gotten through nursing school. So you guys are smart. Anybody that can get through nursing school can get through anesthesia school. It just takes discipline it takes determination and hard work you guys can do this you can do this so cheers until next time guys it was great hanging out with you we'll see you soon